So I've had the same conversation like four times this week about the coming of Jesus like a thief. And over and over, I've heard this sentiment. Do you think there's only a few people that are going to get saved? And I don't. But I think there's only a few people that are going to get resurrected in the first resurrection. I think there's actually going to be quite a few people that get saved after the resurrection. We look at the millennial reign and we see that there are nations for hundreds of years that will be required to bring the wealth of the nations to Jerusalem to offer it at the feast times to Jesus. And when those nations don't come because they don't recognize that Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, no rain falls on their land. The Bible's clear that there's few that find their way to the first resurrection. I think the first resurrection is not very far away, actually. I think it's very close. He's coming like a thief. And so today, I'm going to talk about some of these things related to Ephesians. But today, when I was writing the notes this morning, um, at like 5.30 this morning, I came upon a passage where the disciples looked at Jesus and they said, are there a few people that are going to get in? And he said, yes. (laughs) He said, yes. And you're going to see that passage today. So I was like, Lord, all all week, I'm like, Lord, am I just looking at this too narrowly? And he's like, narrow road. Few find it. Narrow road. Few find it. So this is part of the narrow road. Item one. This is seated in the heavens with Yeshua. This is the last message I'm going to do here in this room uh, for this series in Ephesians. But I'm probably going to actually end up doing some more. Um, at my house or maybe even in Jerusalem because I feel like the Lord's not done talking to me about Ephesians yet. So I'm, uh, I'm going to get basically to about chapter four, um, but there's still two chapters left, okay? So if you're interested in this, uh, just kind of keep an eye out for uh, the stuff that I'm going to be talking about and read Ephesians, which is even better. I just read Ephesians. So uh, item one, put on and put off. Now here we've been talking a ton about, if we just looked at the progression of the way things go, You know, if we think about like 2016, 2017, 2018, we've been talking a ton about repentance. Like that was kind of what we were mostly talking about in those first few years was repentance. And we could easily get into a place where repentance becomes, oh, I got to search the law and find out how to give my heart to you in a way that agrees with all the things, not the Old Testament law, but the the New Testament, all the rules. I got to search this and figure out a way to give you my heart in all these areas. But that's really not what the Lord is looking for in repentance. The Lord's looking for in repentance to take off burdens and to break yokes. And so we started to talk about, after that, kind of like, hey, we can hear this wrong and actually go in the wrong direction. We can become legalistic. We can become discouraged. We can become depressed. We can become all the things, basically, that we read about in Revelation 2 when the Lord addresses Ephesus. He's like, you got, you're checking all the boxes, yes, but something is broken in the way. And today, we're going to be talking about kind of the narrow road of what you have to put on and what you have to put off. So there are things that you actually have to do. It's not all kind of being jello and, you know, I just kind of, I, I can't do anything. There's no strength within me. I'm just going to kind of let it all go and just see what happens. That's the flesh. There is the, I'm going to lock it all down. I'm not going to let anything go. I'm going to make it happen. That's the flesh. But in between, there's a partnership between God and man. There's actually a sonship on on the part of man and a fathership on the part of God or a groom and and a bride, groom and a bride. Okay, so there are some things you actually have to do. And we'd we'd liken that to planting seeds or pulling weeds. And I've heard this analogy many times, and I think it's a helpful one. If we just look at this strip of woods in between our church and the house next door, that's what happens when nothing's going on, when nobody's doing anything. That's what grows. Would you eat most of that stuff? No. Does God want us to actually have stuff to eat? Did he give Adam and Eve a garden to tend? Yes, he gave them a garden to tend. And so the farmer could be like, you know, I plant the seeds, I hold the weeds, and I've made this farm grow. Is that true? No. God made it grow. But the farmer could sit back and be like, I'm not doing anything. We'll see what God grows. Will God make the corn grow? No. He's going to give us what we want. He's going to actually, when we give him our effort, our small, weak, humble is the the key point, effort, he'll make what we put our mind to and our hand to grow if it agrees with what he wants. And he wants us to eat. 
So we have to do our part, and he does his. So this is a list, this first item, which is about half the page of notes. So you're going to notice today I have five pages of notes. I gave myself license for five pages because half the page was the Lord's verses. I'm kidding. Okay. I, I felt like, I, I, I felt like the, the notes were good, and, and we're not going to read all these. So um, these are just all the places. If you search for the words put on, who wrote all these? Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians. Paul, he wrote all these, put on, and then all of the put off, who wrote all those? Mostly Paul, except for the last one, Peter wrote that. Peter was catching up to Paul. Okay, so there's some things you have to put on. You got to put on the armor of light. Where else could you read about that? That's Romans 13, 12. Where else are you going to read about the armor that you put on? Ephesians 6, good. Romans 13, 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, to make no provision for the flesh. First. Corinthians 15, 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. Well, how are you supposed to put on incorruption? If the, if, the, if the grace thing is true and there's really nothing you can do, how do you put on the incorruptible? You give the Lord the, the, your mind, you give him the space inside of you to tell you you're corrupted. Do you let God tell you you're corrupted, not in a way that you're like in a prayer line and you're like, okay, God, I'm going to, what, what, what can I get rid of? But in a way when somebody says something to you offensive that you hear, I'm corrupted. I'm corrupted in the way I want to re react to this. I'm corrupted in the way I'm receiving. I'm corrupted in how bad this makes me feel. Whether it's right or wrong, I'm corrupted in the fact that I don't see myself the way Jesus sees me. I see myself the way this person sees me or the way I'm afraid everybody else is going to see me if they find out what that person says. You see what I'm saying? So the corruption that you have to put off, it's much, much deeper than what you can rummage through your soul and find to offer Jesus because you studied this thing and you think you know what he wants. He's actually, every single day of our lives, when you're re relating to your spouse, your spouse might say something cranky. But there is an opportunity right there to say, okay, I say cranky things to God all the time. I might not even realize. When I complain about what's going on in the world, I'm actually complaining to the one who made it. I, when I complain about somebody across the, you know, the, the road or across the house or wherever, across the office, I'm actually complaining about somebody that I didn't make to a person that made me. Do you see what I'm saying? So when we get in a cranky situation with the people around us, that's always an opportunity to say, am I dealing with this the way that God does? Am I actually growing more like God? Because when I'm complaining, when I'm whiny, when I'm not appreciating what God's done for me, does he quit me? No. I mean, this is amazing, right? He's so patient. He's so kind. And what he's looking for are people that like that style of living. And if I say I want to go to heaven. I say, I believe this thing. I search it for the things I think that God wants me to find in it. But I don't ever value that lifestyle in a way that I'm like, I want to find these things out. I don't want to make provision for my flesh. I want to find these things out. Then he says, okay, that's a seed I'll make grow. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's where we have to get into the, what, what do I put on and what do I put off? Like, what, what do we put off? Romans 13, 12. Let us cast, cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. What he's saying is stop doing works from your flesh. He's not saying, like, stop going to parties. That's not what he's saying. That's not what Jesus did. He's saying stop doing the works that were your idea and in your strength that are wearing you out because it's getting dark outside. And you're going to lose, you're gonna lose an ability to see that you and not God. Ephesians 4.22, you put off concerning your former conduct the old man. Everybody say old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. So if this passage is to believers, which it is, it's Ephesians 4, 22, it's in the book that we've been studying, and he says, put off your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt. How could it be growing corrupt if I'm a believer? How could the old man be growing corrupt? Well, you, can, you don't have to make, let God tell you what to do. You can keep growing in corruption. And you get more corrupt the more you know the right thing to do. God, he doesn't hold you accountable for things that you don't know. But if you do know, you can actually grow corrupt just by studying this word, being in a group of people that are pursuing God. You have to understand the light coming down from heaven makes things grow. So you can read about this in uh, Hebrews 6. And he says, the rain falls on the field, the light shines on it, and some of it grows thorns and thistles, some of it grows righteousness. 
What are you growing in the presence of God? You're not making anything grow. I just want to tell you, nothing. If the, if the growing and corruption has happened, it's because God's patient with you. He's giving you time. He's giving you food. He's giving you light. He's giving you breath. He's giving you air. You know, all the, the culture that you're living in is growing something. What is it growing? What are you growing right now? Are you growing corruption or are you growing in righteousness? And what that means is are you growing more peaceful, more patient, more kind, more gentle, more uh, all the fruits of the Spirit with the people he's given you to grow with? Do you see what I'm saying? And the only way you can do that is if you put off the old man and you put on Christ. And there's a bunch of ways you do that according to all these passages. And that's the basis for what we're talking about this morning. So you can't make righteous coverings for yourself. When you signed up for Jesus, your flesh instantly went into, okay, I'm going to try and be a good person mode. That's everybody. I mean, the, the Bible's written to believers, and every believer has to deal with these issues. But you're supposed to be getting out of all that unrighteousness that you think is righteous and start growing into actual righteousness, which is to put on Christ, okay? So you can't learn your way into righteousness. How many of you, when you first found Jesus, were like, I'm going to read everything I can? That's your flesh. You, can't, you literally can't study your way into heaven. You can't. You can't serve your way into righteousness. You can't give your way into righteousness. You can't heal, forgive, worship, teach your way into righteousness. You can only yield to the righteous one. That's it. You have to, at some point, yield to, I'm living in what I've been planting. And if I want to live in something different, I better start planting something different because he's making it all grow. We are living in a harvest season. He's making stuff grow more right now. Everything is starting to bear fruit or the lack of fruitfulness is starting to become more and more clear. So I want to be a person that's like, okay, I've, I can't make anything grow, but I do have this opportunity to put things on or take things off, and I want to do that. I want to do that, okay? So this is John 10, 8 to 10. All whoever came before me are thieves and robbers. Now, this is Jesus speaking. Who are those that came before him? All of them, all people, all those who came before me that offered you a way into heaven. That's what he's saying. All those who came before me, the sages, all the, the rabbis, the, the, the leaders, the teachers, all of them were thieves and robbers. Did they all know they were thieves and robbers? He says, if, they, if it wasn't my spirit leading them, they're thieves and robbers. Do you see what I'm saying? Israel was full of people trying to tell people the right way to live and how to get to heaven. Full of them. And it had been forever, you know, since the, the beginning of the, of the nation. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. Now, when you read this, you're tempted to be like, because we're about to say the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. You'd be like, oh, that's Satan. Well, he's actually talking about people in this passage, okay? He's talking about people that came before him. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved, and I will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, of the people he's talking about, their father is the devil, Okay? But there's a lot of people that we'd be like, that's a good guy who had, the father, who had their father being the devil. Okay? And I want you to think about Jesus saying, get behind me, Satan, to Peter. Do you get the relationship we're talking about? He's saying, Peter is a thief and a robber when he's saying to me, don't go to the cross. He's a thief and a robber. He's trying to steal from me. There's, there's no way to the father that way. I cannot get to the father going the way Peter told me to go. That's what he's saying. So we have people all around us that are thieves and robbers, right? We're thieves and robbers sometimes. If you want to get righteous, you recognize that. You're like, oh, my flesh wants to do works that actually steal from the way to him. I was having a conversation with a friend yesterday, and, and they were like, I hate it when somebody else is suffering. I'd rather suffer myself. And what the Lord said was, yeah, but what if that was the only way your friend was ever going to see God? Wouldn't it be better for them to see you yielding to the righteousness of God instead of feeling like God, right? But we're all tempted to. That, that friend of mine, we, feel, we all feel this way. I would much rather suffer myself than see Samantha suffer. But God has orchestrated a circumstance, a life of circumstances for Samantha to give her her best possible chance to get to put off corruption and put on Christ. And if I get in the way of that, I'm actually the problem. You see what I'm saying? So he says, all whoever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. 
Luke 13, 23 to 28. Then one said, Lord, are there few who are saved? Listen to what he says. Strive to enter through the narrow gate for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. This is the gate. What I'm describing to you is the gate. And in many ways, we have barred the gate for other people because we didn't want to go in and have him tell us what to do. And we didn't want other people to go in. That's too scary. Like, don't do that. Let's do what makes sense. Let's do what we've learned. Let's do church. Let's do what the Bible says. Let's do what everybody's always known as true. And you are living in a season, everything is changing. Everyone is changing. And your eyes should be opening right now to the fact you live in one of the most apostate generations the earth has ever seen. And that's because there's more revelation right now than there's ever been. And the more God shows us, the more we're held accountable to recognize the problem. What is the problem? It's the flesh. The devil's not the problem. The problem is the flesh. Now, the devil entices us into more flesh, for sure. But God made the devil. God made us. So we have to recognize he's given us a sovereignty over what we can do. We can either wash feet or try to wash whole bodies, right? We can either plant seeds or try to save cities. We can yield to the partnership between God and man. We can come up to the heavens. If you go up to the heavens like Ephesians is talking about, you will do what I'm saying because you'll see him and you'll come down in your arrogance and pride in the fear of the Lord. Everybody that sees God, this is what they do. They come down. They go, they go down on the ground. I'm a man of unclean lips. John laid on the ground like a dead man. Daniel lay down afraid, and every time God says, don't be afraid, stand up, let me tell you what to do. We have to be a people that are in this mode right now, recognizing this is a moment in time to see the world completely differently, okay? Once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. Now, this, this should remind you of the parable of the ten bridesmaids, right? Lord, Lord, open to us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you, where you are from. Then you will begin to say, that's because they weren't dwelling in the heavens with God. Now, when you hear the phrase dwelling in the heavens with God, if you're like me, you probably picture kind of sitting in this room, maybe in, you know, I picture in my living room at like five in the morning when no one else is awake and I've got my eyes closed and I'm talking to the Lord. That's definitely dwelling in the heavens with God, if it is. But it's more than that. We're dwelling with Jesus right now in this room. He has a body. It's not just the head. Steph was prophesying it during worship. It's not just the head. We have to, to abide in heaven with God. We actually, actually have to abide together also, right? Because we're all part of his body. So there's no you and Jesus going off into the sunset together. That's never going to happen. The American mindset is way different than most of the rest of the world, which wouldn't ever picture that. But we're very individualistic. We're very kind of my 10 acres, my house, my stuff. I'm going to kind of go it alone if I have to, but I'll do it with you if we can. That's, a, that's an American antichrist mindset. You don't want that. You actually want to say, okay, I'm not the only one here. I didn't make me and I didn't make you. He made us both. What do you want, God? And what he says over and over and over and over is learn how to love each other like I love you so we can all live together. That's what we're doing here. And we have to put that on. You can't make that happen. You can't make that grow. You can only put it on and put off the places where you don't like people, where you don't, especially people that you expect to act better than they do. That's where we usually get into trouble. You don't expect something from somebody. You're kind of like, whatever, that's that person. You expect something from somebody. They can offend you when they don't measure up to your, to your expectations. Okay? And this is what he's talking about here, about this narrow way. And they'll say, we ate and drank in your presence. You taught in our streets. But he'll say, I tell you, I don't know you. Where are you from? Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, this is most believers. According to this passage, they're like, are there a few who find it? He's like, it's narrow. He wasn't like, guys, calm down. There's going to be lots of people that are saved. You're not the only ones. He didn't say that. He said, it's narrow. It is narrow. And there's going to be a ton of people that appear before me. And I'm going to be like, you and I weren't hanging out together, and it's not just going to be you didn't pray and spend time in your mind's eye with me. He's going to say, you never really were engaged and connected to my body. <laughs> like, you didn't learn all the hard lessons of the interaction with people that are difficult. You never learned to get out of this world and up here and see people the way that I see them. 
You never learned to put on Christ. You never learned to put on heaven. You never learned to put off the old man. You never learned to actually let me change you. You knew it needed to happen. You offered me parts of you that you thought, oh, you could change that, God. But I want you to see the world the way that I see it. I want you to see it with me so you can be in the fear of the Lord next to me and in the fear of the Lord when you look at the world around you. We actually need to have the fear of the Lord both, right? This is what he's saying. He says, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out, you don't want that to happen. You don't want us to read these stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and miss the point of what they're talking about. They're talking about people that learn to restrain their own flesh to tell God about their weakness, to be plain and unable to accomplish the things that God had set before them, and to trust God. That's what you're reading about when you read about these people. The narrow gate is controlling what you put on and off and leaving the rest to Jesus. We mostly do the exact opposite. We try to do all the things that we think Jesus wants done, and we neglect putting on and putting off stuff from our own soul. That's mostly what we do, right? Even, even people that we study this all the time, we mostly try to do, we feel guilty if the things Jesus wants done aren't done. And then we miss the fact that all of the pain in the context of conflict is actually to get us to see, I got to change. I got to change. We plant the seeds, that means pray, ask for God to change us. We pull the weeds, that means repent, recognize where our flesh is rising up above God. Only God makes it grow. This is so simple. This is the narrow road. If you really believed this, you'd actually be in prayer meetings all the time. If you really believed hanging out with God meant hanging out with his body and coming up to the heavens, and that the really the only thing you could do were plant seeds and pull weeds, and he was going to make everything grow, you'd mostly gladly spend your time in prayer meetings. When you ran into conflict, you'd stop everything and be like, God, I'm living in some kind of field here. I didn't realize I had planted all these seeds. But I want to actually pull up these weeds and actually start hearing, what do, you, what do I need to put on? Like, when you find yourself in conflict, is this what you're thinking? When you're at work and you find yourself in conflict or you're at school or when Sam and I are fighting or whatever it is, is this the mode that I'm in to say, oh, wait a second. This, I'm living in a field I planted. <laughs> I think we mostly aren't. But we're living in a season that the Bible promises the narrow few are going to recognize it. And they're actually going to get serious day and night, praying that God would avenge his own elect. Avenge from who? From the flesh. Very good. That's what's happening right now. This, this thing that we're talking about right here, we're not the only ones talking about this. It's all over the earth right now. We have to recognize there is an opportunity here to actually go into the pure spotless bride. But for that to happen, we have to put off the old man. We have to actually get rid of all of the tethers we have to this life here. What I'm talking about is faith and risk, like huge risk. But that's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? They did something unique in their generation. Are you doing something unique in your generation? This is what the Lord would ask us. Matthew 7, 11 to 14. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. Now this is the only narrow road there is. What I just described to you, that is the narrow road. If you search it out, you'll find this over and over in the several passages that talk about the narrowness. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Or we say ask. So this is the passage in Matthew 7 where he says, ask and you'll receive. Seek, you'll find. Knock, the doors open. This is right after that, okay? Enter, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, or we say men to do to you, do also to them. Is this about just you and God? No. It's about asking and receiving because you're having an influence on people God made. You're actually impacting Jesus' body. Jesus is like, when you give me a cold cup of water, I'm going to reward you. You visit me in the hospital. You visit me in prison. I'm going to say to you, you're a sheep. Come here. Be on my side. You came through the one gate that there was. But if you don't do that, then I'm going to say, get away from me, goats. And they're both going to say, God, when did we do that for you? Right? Right? He says, when you do it for my body, when you do it for one of the least of these, my brethren. He's talking about the household of God. He's not talking about going and finding the soup kitchen in town and feeding people that don't know him. That's not what that passage is about. It's about how you deal with Jesus, his body, the people that are part of his body. It's not metaphorical. It's real. You, Mary, you are part of Jesus. If I look at you and I don't see Jesus, I don't see you right. If I hear you 
and I don't hear Jesus talking, I'm not actually hearing you right. But I also have to recognize that you're like me, and you're growing, you're putting stuff on and taking stuff off, that there's this process, because when Jesus sees me, he doesn't see all of me all given to Jesus yet. He's so patient. He's willing to wait through that beautiful, glorious process that we call life. And this is what he's inviting us to. Now, if if we do this, what he's saying, we'd feel much better about people, which means we'd feel much better about situations, which means we'd feel much better about circumstances, which means we'd feel much better about life. But we mostly feel annoyed about people, so we feel scared in situations, and that makes our circumstances feel like challenges, and we mostly find life difficult, right? Right? Did Adam and Eve find life difficult before they ate the fruit? No, that was kind of the problem. They were bored just being babies that should have been gods. They wanted to create some challenges. They wanted some more responsibility. They wanted some more revelation, some more wisdom. The fruit looked good. Do you see what I'm saying? This is what the Bible's addressing. This is what the redemptive plan is addressing. So he says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give those to those who ask him? Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many, most, according to the Bible, that word is actually translated often most, who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are only a few who find it. What is the gate? We just read it just on the last page. Jesus. Jesus is the only gate. He's the only way. He's the only one that's going to get credit for saving anyone. He's the only one that's going to get the glory for the situation being resolved. God is not going to let anybody else share in his son's glory. I've heard this taught wrong, and I've taught it myself wrong, that he meant him and all of the people, you know, that are part of the bride. But that's a wrong way to look at it. He meant him (laughs) and all the people who yield and say it was all him. Can you do all the stuff and not get all the glory? No, you can't. You have to be a person that recognizes, I can't do any of this, and none of the glory is mine. Do you see what I'm saying? If you try to grit your teeth and do all the stuff for Jesus, and I'm not going to take any of the glory, it was all God. Well, if it was all God, it would be a lot better than the way you did it. It would be. So we have to be weak, broken kids that are like, I'm planting seeds and pulling weeds. Yes, there is something for me to actually do. It does matter, but I can't make any of it grow. And in that place of humility, does it sound like Jesus? This is the way Jesus lived. Did he do anything amazing? Did he do it? He says, I can't do anything but what I see the Father doing. He says, the Son of Man could do nothing of his own accord. Now, did Jesus put that on? Yes, he did. He said, I could call on 12 legions of angels if I want to. I'm putting on something. He says, I sanctified myself that you would be sanctified. Can you live in the light burden and the easy yoke of none of this being your fault or your responsibility, but all of it being your opportunity to intercede? Can you live in that narrow, easy yoke, light burden of, it's not my fault that your life's going bad. I can't fix your life, but I can pray for you. And if I plant those seeds and it agrees with him, it, makes, it matters that I hear what he's saying about you and I can stay engaged with you, though you're, you've got problems. Isn't that what Jesus did? He didn't make anyone righteous. He prayed to his father that the father would make them righteous. But even the father refuses to make us be righteous. He just organizes our circumstances and sends light and rain on the things we plant. And some people, they don't want God. They don't want heaven. They don't want good things to grow. They want thorns and thistles to grow, like Adam and Eve. We're not different than Adam and Eve. We're that same kind. The only thing that's different is we lack the spirit inside of us until we say yes to Jesus, and then we have an opportunity to invite the spirit to fully take us over again. That's the only difference. And this is what God's inviting us to right now, is to recognize, man, I've got corruption because people... They seem like challenges to me. They seem like burdens to me. They seem like they're going to mess everything up. They seem like they're opportunities to me. They seem like they're the gate to me. They seem like they're the door to me, both. And we have to be people that are like, no, I refuse to be rescued by anyone with Jesus, and I refuse to rescue anybody. I want to let Jesus rescue them. Can we live in that tension? It's only tension if we think things are our responsibility, but they're not. 
And this is the, the viewpoint of Ephesians. This is what Paul is really getting to, okay? So this only happens, this entering by the narrow gate, it only happens in the context of difficult people that you stay engaged with, which means tell the truth to, believe in, run with, and forgive over and over and over and over. And we'd be like, how many times? How many times? Anybody know? 70 times 7. That's a lot of times to forgive somebody for a big offense. If somebody's offended you, what is that, uh, 140? That's a lot of times. I can't even do the math on the fly. Tim's doing it back there. That's a lot of times. You, haven't, you really haven't forgiven anybody that much. You've probably forgiven the worst offender three or four times. Are you running out of what it takes to forgive people? If so, you're running out of what it takes to endure this time of harvest. Are you running out of what it takes to believe in people? If so, you're running out of what it takes to endure this harvest. Are you running out of what it takes to stay engaged, vulnerable? That's what that means. Open, connected to people. If so, you're running out of what it takes to endure this harvest. Now, what is, what is, trying to be, what is the devil trying to pull out of the earth? Love. Love is growing cold. He says, you're going to be offered a tribulation. I'm going to see if you like this place that I want to invite you to. I want you to come live in heaven with me. I'm going to see if you like it. So in the last generation, I'm going to raise up a pure and spotless bride. I'm going to offer you up to tribulation is what that means. Just like my son, just like Jesus, just like Peter, just like James, just like Paul. I'm going to offer you up to tribulation. Many will be offended. The same many that won't go through the narrow gate. The same many that will say, I prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name. But he's like, I offered you trouble, and you didn't say yes. This is my opportunity to change. Not just trouble in the world, not just political trouble, not just trouble across town, not just trouble in the newspaper, trouble in your house, trouble with your kids, trouble with your church, trouble with you. Can you actually see what Jesus is doing in you? Or do you think you've grown some good stuff? I mean, honestly, do you think? I've gotten a hold of some of these things. You haven't. You've gotten a hold of none of these things. He's gotten a hold of some of these things. And if he has, he's gotten a hold of your heart. He's gotten a hold of a little bit of your heart to say, I'm weak and broken, and he made me that way. He actually made me to be dust without him. This is hard on the flesh. It's easy on the spirit, though. And you need this buoyancy to make it through what's coming. Because there's going to be a lot of accusation about what you do or don't do to put out the fires all around you. Did you guys see Hawaii? Have you seen any of these press conferences? Have you seen the way that political parties are using accusations to try and take each other down, even though a 1,000 people are dead? Literally fighting over the dead bodies about whose fault it is. This is coming to the church. It's actually coming out of the church, to be honest with you. We have got to get to the place where we're not trying to figure out whose fault it is. We have to get to the place where we're like, this is the context where I learn to forgive enemies, love people that hate me, bless those that curse me, pray for those that spitefully use me. Not just use me, not just made a mistake, and yeah, they used me. I've been saying this to the Lord. God, I've been getting used in this situation. And he's like, good. You know a little tiny itty bitty bit about being Jesus, but did they spitefully use you? No, actually they didn't spitefully use me. We spitefully use Jesus all the time to get what we want. We don't even recognize it, but neither do the people that spitefully use you. (laughs) If they did recognize it, they wouldn't do it. If they thought they were doing something a bad person would do, they wouldn't do it. Everybody wants to be a good person. Literally everybody. It's in the human DNA. Can you recognize the people around you that don't know any better, but you know. You know. You know better. So you can actually grow. That's what you want. You want to grow. Okay, so this only happens in the context of difficult people. Jesus loves and accepts everyone that wants his leadership, and he expects and gives grace to all to sharpen one another into that leadership, which will create a pure and spotless bride. There will be a pure and spotless bride. Will we be a part of it? That's the question. There will be a pure and spotless bride. This is not a plan that is designed to fail. This is a plan that is designed to work. And the more that I look at the plan, the more I'm like, it is working, actually. And I want it to work all the way. you got to see this. you got to get vision for the fact that if you're changed at all, you're changed because Jesus did something amazing. And it happened not when you learned all this stuff, served all this stuff, gave all this stuff. It happened when you recognized you had to change. 
You actually weren't, you were the problem. And if you weren't the whole problem, you were enough of a problem that you could change. Every single marital argument I've ever been a part of was Sam's fault. <laughs> Tim, I love you. He jokingly said, obviously, for the sake of stream. No, every, every single fight we've ever been in, every single one, even, even ones where I could be like, it, that seems so unjust. There was something for me to change in it. There was something, I assume there was something for you to change in it. This is true of all your conflict. Because Jesus, nobody could really fight with Jesus. He was living somewhere else. He was living in an entirely different value system. He was looking for people to love. And if you're not like him, you're not going with him. I hate to say it, but you're not. I mean, I don't hate to say it. I love it. Because that's, that's what makes heaven pure. He's never going to make people love heaven. And mostly we wouldn't like it right now. Mostly we wouldn't. But he's given us this perfect set of circumstances to qualify a few into the first resurrection so they can lead the many for a thousand years into it. Okay? That's mostly what's going to happen. So the letters to the seven churches are specific last day's messages to the church about what to put on and put off. And if you want to know, you can see he gives every of the seven churches a physical evaluation. Ephesus, he says, you're doing all these things great. You're lacking love. That's her physical evaluation. This is one of the things she needs to put on. You need to put on love as well. You need to put on love. You really do. And it's, somebody else can't do that for you. You can only do that for you. Okay? You have to plant those seeds. And you can't make the love grow. You can just say, God... I am loveless, and it doesn't matter what the other person does. I am loveless. That's a problem, right? So Ephesus has a righteousness of her own that will be rejected. If she doesn't actually yield to this, she will not go to heaven, even though she has all these great attributes. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, right, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, he holds the messengers. He's like, I sent you the right messages, and walks in the midst of the golden lampstands. He says, I'm at your church. I gave you the messages. I'm at your church. I'm leading the church, and I'm at your church is what he's saying. That's what he means. I know your works, your labor, your patience. Well, Jesus, if you're leading the church and you're in the church, why is the church growing some stuff that's not like you? Because he's not going to make anybody pick heaven. None people. Even Ephesus, even the seven churches he picks out to write letters to. He's not going to make you righteous unless you say, Jesus, I got to be more righteous than this. And plant some seeds, put some stuff on, put some stuff off, okay? It's all about you changing in the context of other people that don't seem to want to change that much, but sometimes they do, and you get inspired by them changing, so you want to change too. It's sharpening each other. It's growing. It's all the analogies, right? I know your works, your labor, your patience. I'm there. That you cannot bear those who are evil. And you've tested those that say they're apostles and are not, and I found them. Now, the Lord said to me this morning, he said, Tom, I'm there. I'm in the meeting. I know what everybody's thinking. I know where they delude themselves. I know where you delude yourself, Tom. I know where you run a circuit around what's true, and everybody around you knows it, and you refuse to see it. He says, I know where that happens. He says, I'm patient with you. I love you. I want the people around you, when they see that thing, to be patient with you and love you too. Right? I want you, when you see that thing, to be patient and know that I love you too. Like, can we live in this environment? Not without this. Not without us actually putting something on that we don't have and actually saying, this will never, this, this room will never make it into heaven the way it is right now. If he came right now, he, we would not go. Paul said, I don't think I've obtained it. But this is what I do. I forget what's behind me and I run this race. And then he said to Timothy at one point in time, he says, I got the crown. I got it. I got it. How? How did you know you got it? Paul, he says, I'm pouring myself out like a drink offering. Everybody's left me and I still love them. That's how I know I got it. They all canceled me, and I didn't cancel any of them. That's how I know I got that crown. That's how I know I'm like Jesus, right? That's what we need. This is doable. What I'm saying is not impossible. If you plant it, it will grow. But if you don't, it will not. And if you plant it alongside a bunch of weeds, the weeds will choke it out. If you plant it in stony ground, the stones, when the heat comes, the stones won't be enough soil to hold it. If you plant it, and then you live your life where all the birds are, the birds will come and eat it and take it away. You have to plant it in good soil. You have to give yourself to this, right? This is so important. We need to not give up the fellowship a habit of meeting together. Even more so as we see the day approaching, we need to plant more seeds. We need to recognize the field we're living in, the problems we have. They're our fault, not everybody else's fault. 
There are things he told us to pray for. He's been saying this to me over and over. He says, Tom, I told you to pray for some things two years ago, three years ago, five years ago. You refused to see your need. You preached them, but you refused to see your need for them. Can you recognize this is a field of your own making? Can you? This is a field of our making. If none of us would have said yes to Light Hop, something else would have happened with this building. He would have done something else. He would have grown something with other people. But we did say yes. Did that make it all great? No, of course not. We're learning to live a real life with a real God who refuses, put so much dignity on what we want that we could actually look around and be like, some of this is what we wanted. And I could change. I could actually change what I want. Isn't that gloriously hopeful? I could change what I want. I could live in my, my, life, in my life with my wife, and I could say some of this is actually what I, you know, what I created, we could actually go forward together even more. And I'm so thankful for my life with Samantha. But my kids, my career, the people in my city, the nation, can we look at the nation and be like, this is what we wanted, actually? Can we look at the world? And say, this was in, I mean, there's so many things I could have prayed for that I didn't that are happening right now. And I know that they were going to happen. I just never really took the time to believe that my little words would do anything about it. Now's the time to take the time to believe that. Your words can do something about it. You can put something on. You can take something up. Jesus changed the entire universe in three and a half years. And he didn't make anybody believe anything. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? He changed the whole creation. Everything, planets we've never even heard of are going to grow different forever because Jesus obeyed God. Do you want to be a part of that? You want to be a part of his body. Are you willing to see time right? Are you willing to say, this is the the planting season. This is the time for me to be born again. This is the time for me to change. This isn't the time for me to see everything great. This is the time for me to change. This is the time for me to lose my life so I can find the one where I see that Jesus has literally made worlds that were created to be inhabited with glory. That's going to take a long time. This is what Paul's talking about in in Ephesians. This is what the whole Bible's actually talking about. It says, as you persevere and have patience, labor for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Remember, therefore, where you've fallen. Now, it's easy to hear this first love and think of an emotion. You know, I lost that loving feeling. Sounds like a song. I think, was it the righteous? Who was that? The righteous brothers? That's not what that's talking about. He says, you've lost the connection to love, to God. God. You love because God first loved you. You've lost this connection to how he feels about you and about people. You think that you can do all the stuff separate from the vine. You can't. It's impossible. And if you're in the vine, then you're actually growing like Jesus. Do you see what I'm saying? So we have to do a real honest reflection. And I think if we do this, I think we're going to come up short. If we're just like, okay, in the last however many years we've been doing this light hop thing, am I softer towards all the people that left, all the people that stayed, all the people that pray? Am I way more quick to be like, this is a great person that's learning some hard lessons, and so am I? We're really not. We're mostly kind of tired and doing something kind of over and over, and he wants us to actually say, this thing that I've been doing over and over, I'm going to do something over and over. I'm actually, I want to look at the, the atmosphere and plant something new. I want, to, I want to take a new grip with tired hands, strengthen weak knees, and say, this is all happening because this is actually, some of the stuff just shows there's power in my prayers. There's power in what I don't pray. There's power in what I do pray. And if I can be honest about that, then I can have a great opportunity for God to reveal something to me that he's going to do in the last days. Do you see what I'm saying? There's something amazing happening right now. Great darkness is covering the earth. That means the light is going to shine so, so bright. It's got nothing to do with big numbers. It's got nothing to do with a bunch of people getting it. It's got to do with us saying, there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in what I put on and what I take off. 
says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You've left your first love. Remember, where, therefore, where you, from where you've fallen and repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Jesus is present with us right now. He knows deeply what we're thinking, what we believe about the people he's put us with, and whether or not we want his leadership or just the fruit of righteous living. Do we just want to be good people when it's all said and done, or do we like his leadership today, like right now? Do we like putting off every part of our lives but him? and trusting that he'll give us back every part of our lives that we need. Do we like that, or we're like, someday, that'd be great. Matthew 12, 25, Jesus knew their thoughts, every single thought he knows in this room, and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Is our house divided? Is our house divided? Yeah, this house is divided. If this house is divided... This house is divided. If this house is divided, this house is divided. So what do we do? We get rid of the division. We get rid of the enmity. How? We start planting seeds about the division, not how the other people are dividing everything, how I am dividing my own heart, how I'm dividing my own marriage, how I'm dividing my own family, how I'm dividing my own church, okay? Now, this should not be a weight on you because you can't do anything about your heart. If you could, Jesus wouldn't have died on the cross. You really can't do anything about your marriage. If you could, you wouldn't have promised before God that, to stay married because you needed his help. You can't really do anything about your family. Those kids, they're not yours. You didn't make them. He made them. Your church, he's creating that, not you. Your city, like all this was his idea. So none of these things can you do anything about except for the seeds you plant and the weeds you pull in you. That's all you can do. That's light. What I'm telling you, anybody can do it. Like, it's so simple, anyone can do it. It's so easy, anybody can do it. It's so simple and easy, most people won't. Most people want more responsibility than that. But we are failing under the weight of our own arrogance. We're failing under it. And part of what's happening in every church, not just Light Hop, is failing under the weight of our own arrogance. He gave us COVID for a reason. He wanted to see what we would do. What's coming is way harder than COVID. Way harder. So if we do anything but put on Christ and put off ourselves, he will reject and punish us. Not just reject us, he will punish us. Jesus will provide over the, the smoke, the torment, and the burning of the harlot Babylon forever. Forever. This is because we divide his body when we try to separate him from it. If I'm like me and Jesus, we're just going to do this thing because everybody else is an idiot. He's like, you're dividing my body. You're separating me from the people that I made and the people I'm with. You're actually the one that's delusional. You're off on your own. He's like, I would never leave my body. I will never go off with you by ourselves. I will always stay faithful. Now, he leaves the 99 to go after the one. That is true. He will seek out the one. But if that's your mode of living, he will let you go. He will let you go. He's merciful, but he's not dumb. He will let you go. He's building a family. He's redeeming a family. If we separate even the thief on the cross from Jesus' body, we cannot be his. He said this to me this morning. as clear as I'm talking to you. He said, look at what the thief on the cross did. Look at his righteous works. Look at all the great things he learned. Look at the amazing theology he had taken on. If you separate that guy from Jesus, you can't be his. So what is on you, actually, to grow, become, learn, do? Nothing. It's all on you to yield to his leadership. And you could yield to his leadership like that thief on the cross did in that moment, and he said, I'll be, you'll be with me in paradise today, buddy. Can you let people be part of Jesus' body like that? Or do they have to learn what you learn, think what you think, do what you do? Do they have to line up? Are you running out of patience with them? When are they going to get this? How are they going to... Do you see what I'm saying? He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that with you. <laughs> he doesn't do that with me. So we have to be a people that yield. Oh. God, if I were running this, I'd do it a lot different. He's like, thank God you weren't. Thank God you weren't. But Jesus, and he'll give us his spirit so that we can. And all we got to do is plant the seeds and pull the weeds. Luke eleven twenty three, 23. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Have you scattered the body of Jesus in this room? Yes. Can you plant different seeds? Yes. Have I scattered the body of Jesus in this room? Absolutely. Probably more so than most. Can I plant different seeds? Yes. Yes, I can. 
John 15, 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they're burned. Can you find like-minded people who are annoyed about that person like you are? Yes. Can you both get each other burned? Yes. Don't do it. Don't go there. It's not worth it. I find myself repenting of this several times a week. I just wish I had some sense and some brains. Stop talking. But I, my heart hurts, and I want people to see things the way that I do. And, I, you know, I want people to be my savior, or my rescuer, or my confidant, or my companion, or my Jesus. I want people to be my Jesus. <laughs> and he's like, let's talk about it, me and you. And I feel different about that person. I, many times I've told him the very same things. And he's like, look, you're kind of being a little bit ridiculous because don't you do the exact things that bug you so much in other people? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> he's like, right. So do you see how I like you? Like that person, too. Maybe their sin isn't any worse than yours. Maybe there's something you could change. Maybe I'm highlighting it to you and somebody else so that you'll change. Oh, right. Okay. He's so patient. To abide in Jesus means much more than to sit before his throne in our mind's eye or to meditate on him or even to pray and obey. To abide in Jesus is to also abide in his body. You have to have fellowship with other difficult and disagreeable believers in love. So it's... We're at a point in time, we're like, like this Ephesus point in time, we're like, I'm staying in it with you. I love you. I forgive you. Come on, I forgive you, I already forgave you. No, if Jesus talked to you like that, would you like that? He knows you're talking about his friends that way. He sees it. He sees it. And there are some heinous violations of you that these people have done. Heinous. He sees that too. Can you be okay that he knows how to navigate it in love? And you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to, get, you don't have to guard yourself. You don't have to get your rights. You don't have to deal with other human beings, any human beings. You don't have to deal with any other human beings afraid and guarded. You can be like Jesus. Jesus literally tried to throw him off a cliff. He walked right through. It wasn't his time yet. And when it was his time, he went up on a cross. Is that the life you want? What if this is your cross moment and you're resisting it? Oh, wouldn't that be the greatest regret ever to have spent decades not doing anything that everybody else thought was fun, getting annoyed, and then miss the one thing that you're supposed to embrace when it comes your way? I think we mostly are. Like, I really think we most, if you're like me, we mostly are. But he's like, I'm so willing to grow something new with this fall. This fall. He told me this fall is a harvest fall. This is a harvest fall. If you want it, if you can get it, if you can receive it. Can you receive something in faith? Can you get out of your own brain and say, yeah, this is a harvest fall. Even if it's not the harvest fall, it's enough of a harvest fall. I'm going to get something new. What if this was the start? What if today was the day everything changed for you? What if today was the day everything changed just because you started to plant different seeds? Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't it be worth it? Be worth it. the whole legacy, the whole history of everything that's happened. If you came to a point in your life before Jesus returned where you just gave it all to being weak and meek and a child and planting some seeds and trusting that he could make it grow that afternoon like the thief on the cross or this season or next year. Like that, that thief on the cross planted one seed and harvested an entire eternity of glory. One seed, one afternoon. What's God saying to us this, this morning? What's he saying? Who's your enemy? Who's the problem? Who are you guarding your heart against? Who do you try? You, you avoid certain conversations. My, my older sister, and I'm not picking on her because she's just really amazing, but she has this list that she used to have of things we couldn't talk about. <laughs> she's like, if we talk about that, we're going to fight. If we talk about that, he's going to wig out. If we... And I think she's given up her list in this season because God has disrupted her, her boat. Do you have a list of things you just don't say because you know if you go there? That's you managing the world. God, I got a problem. I hate conflict. I hate a cross. What are you saying? What are you saying, God? Julie, forgive me. All right. A couple more minutes here. So to abide in Jesus means you have to abide with difficult and disagreeable people in love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. It doesn't parade itself. It's not puffed up. It doesn't behave rudely. It doesn't seek its own. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. 
It bears all things. It believes all things. You should be hearing some weeds all around you right now. You can hear the wind rustling through these weeds. Hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. It's like not running out. Because it's the love of God. The love that the Bible's talking about, it's not like, oh, we're getting, we're getting short on supply here. It's the love of God. Are you tapped in? Is it flowing through you? Or are you trying to grit your teeth and be a little less weedy and a little more fruitful? If you're trying to grit your teeth and be less weedy and more fruitful, you're going to go to hell. No one is going to get credit in heaven for that. If you're opening your heart and saying, God, there's some stuff restricting the flow here. I can't make it go away. But it's not okay. I'm planting the seeds of my own death right now. He will resurrect it in glory. He will. You will be in heaven with him. This, you know, this very moment, he says to the people on the cross. This very moment. When you put heavy loads on yourself, you divide Jesus' body. You're setting an example. You're being a witness of a false gospel. He's not okay with that. He's not okay with you being like, I love Jesus with all my heart. I go to prayer meetings. He's, he's amazing. I just have to get a little bit better at this thing. I'm gritting my teeth in this area. That's a false witness. That's a false witness. Where are we being false witnesses? At lots of places, I want to tell you, lots of places where we feel like we got to save the world. Lots of places where we feel like we got to get better at this. You can't get better at it. You can only get more vulnerable, more open, more real, more dusty, okay? Be dusty. This is only a spirit-filled reality. Your flesh can't do this love. To do this, you have to put off you and put on Jesus. That means you have to let Jesus change your entire life. Revelation 3, 18 to 19, I counsel to you, buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. Does he want you poor? No. Does he want you naked? No. Does he want you blind? No. He wants you holy, righteous. This is the only gate, though. This is it. That you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eyes have, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Do you love people like Jesus does? Do you rebuke and chasten people in love? Without giving up on them, without believing their ministry is about to end, without thinking that they can't change, are you willing to rebuke and chasten like Jesus does when he does, in the, in the spirit of the way that he does it? How does he rebuke and chasten you? He rebukes and chastens me. Does he, raise your hand if he's ever rebuked and chastened you. Raise your hand if he's doing it this morning. Does he do it in love? He does it more loving than I do. I want to tell you, I'm, I'm in the way a little bit of this message coming through, but he does it in a way that you could miss it if you weren't paying attention. He does it so gentle. He, he defines gentleness. It's the fruit of his spirit. He does it so patient, so kind, so loving, so joyfully. He does it joyfully. Can you do it joyfully but do it? This is what he's asking all of us right now. He's, he's actually been saying that this in this room since about 2017. Have you prayed for it? Are you living in a field of your own planting? I think both. I think there's a lot of power. There's a lot of dignity on what we could ask for right now. A lot. Okay? This is based on the principle of reaping and sowing. You're living in the field you planted sometime before now, and I give you this Galatians passage. Uh, we need to read it, though. You're abiding in Jesus to the measure you sowed to that in the past. Okay, so you're abiding in Jesus to the measure. You, he was like, he pricked your heart. He's like, you need to be a witness in this way. This is something you should be praying for, and then seeing, measuring, am I living more and more as a witness? Am I getting more conflict and saying more to love, yes to love in the conflict? And if you're not, what did you do? What did you pray? What did you think about? What did, where, how patient were you with the world and impatient with Jesus, his body, right? How much were you kind of like, you know, yeah, that's, that witness thing is going to take care of itself somehow, someday, I don't know. And he surrounded you with a bunch of difficult people, and you're like, mm. are you following me? So, for years, Jesus has been saying this message in this room. He's been saying, if you don't have a cross, you're not mine. He's been giving us over and over and over again truths from the word that you, have, you actually have to follow him in the fellowship of his suffering this way. And he's given us probably 
4,000 prayer meetings in that time? Did we plant all the things he told us we were going to need so that in this season we're like, I love the conflict. I love it when people misunderstand me. I love it when they lie about me. I love it when they accuse me. I'm actually, yes, this is, I'm in the fellowship. I count it all joy when they persecute me for his name's sake. No. <laughs> some, but not all, yeah. So we're living in some of the realities we planted, but you need more is what I'm saying. You need so much more. Love is growing cold. And so this is a time to recognize there's, I could have actually lived in this season. Now, you, it's not just conflicts here. There's conflicts at home. There's conflicts at the workplace. There's conflicts in the world. There's conflicts literally in the news. And if you're like, I'm turning off the news because I don't want to hear any more conflict, you have a problem. Jesus is not turning off the news. He's not tuning out the Trumpies. He's not tuning out the Biden people. He loves them. He made them. Their, their heart's not beating except for by him. He's not tuning out your husband. He's not tuning out your wife. He's not tuning out your kids. He's not tuning out any of this. He's not getting off by himself, except for the extent where he fills up on the Father's heart for all these things, right? Is this what we planted? Is this what we're living in? I don't know about you, but me, no. I say no, but some, a little bit. So we'd be like, you could, you could, this isn't a, a, a question to try and trap you and say you're wrong. This is a question to say, is your heart open to recognize what's really true? Is your heart open to recognize what's really true? Is this, do you want to take this heart into heaven? No. So we want to plant some stuff, right? Are you following me? Okay, did that, did that clear it up? Helped a little, okay. Okay, so this is only a spirit-filled reality. You can't do this on your own. It's based on reaping and sowing. Okay, so I'm going to read this, Galatians 6, 1 to 10. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Recognize, when you see something in someone else, there is a temptation in your flesh to take on that very same spirit. The devil's no dummy. He knows how to provoke your flesh. And if you see something in somebody else and you're like, this has to get addressed, you have to recognize. You're recognizing it because you know it. It's something that is, makes sense to you what's happening. doesn't make sense to everybody. If you recognize it and you know it, there's a good chance you do it and you're susceptible to it. And this is what this patch is talking about. Like, can you just get rid of whose fault it is and say, okay, there's a chance for me to recognize something in me right now in this conflict, okay? Bear one another's burdens. Everybody say that. Bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, I want you to go jump down before we read anything else and look at, at verse 5. Each one shall bear his own load. Wait a second. You said bear each other's burdens. How can each one bear his own load? Which one's true? Yes. You bear other people's burdens. You don't expect anybody to bear yours. This is the way Jesus lived. Why? How could he do that? Well, he had someone bearing his burden. Who? The Father. I can bear your burden. But I don't have to expect you to bear other people's burdens, and you don't have to, you're not going to bear mine. I'm going to actually grow in a confidence that Jesus is bearing it all for me. This makes you a river and not a traitor. Do you see what I'm saying? If we're like, we're supposed to bear each other's burdens, this is what broke the church in Acts 6. I'm tired of waiting on these widows. <laughs> Somebody else do it. Jesus, he didn't get tired of bearing people's burdens. He said, I came not to be served, but to serve. If that's what I did, you do it too. So when we read this, you got to keep that in mind. This is talking about something really specific, okay? In a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. But if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work. Now, you, you can know this when you're annoyed that people aren't doing what you think they should do for you because you did something for them. And we all feel that. And he's saying, don't think too much of yourself. Recognize you got to change. That, I, he's like, I'm not with you in that little sidebar conversation and being like, yeah, you're right. He's not in that. He's like, let's talk about you. I'll talk about the person to the person. Let's talk about you. I just highlighted something to you. If anyone thinks he himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he all will also reap. 
For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And you can have a false gospel, a false imagination that you're just in this hard thing, you've been doing all the right things, and you're going to make it through, and yes, Jesus is going to vindicate it all, and it's all going to get wiped away, and all of your tears are going to be wiped away, and he would say, some of what you're living in is you. It's not all a story about your heroism. Some of it is literally what you wanted. Can you live in the truth of that? Can you be like Peter and have me say to you, get behind me, Satan, and say, okay, I'm going to keep following you. He just said something really confusing to me. (laughs) I was trying to help him. I mean, could you imagine being Peter and being like, no, 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 Lord, not the cross for you. And and Jesus, the Son of God, say to you, get behind me, Satan. That took some faith to keep walking with Jesus. That took something to be like, okay, I'm going to wait for further information here because I I thought I was helping, right? This is what it means to be in truth. This is truth. This isn't pleasantries. So in this last part, we're going to take a couple seconds um, you can read the rest of that if you want to. Oh, I want you to read verse 10. So do all this, like God's not mocked, you reap what you sow. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. It's actually much more important that you learn to live in the fruit of the Spirit with believers than it is with unbelievers. It's way easier with unbelievers. Your expectations of them are so low they don't offend you. Believers you expect something from. This is where your heart is provoked to be arrogant, okay, and not like Jesus. Okay, truth and love. I want to read these last three Ephesians passages, and I want to say this, this last thing about the core, uh, the core value of the whole book. This is the last time I'm going to get a chance to say it. Ephesians 1, 17 and 19. That the Lord God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Now, these are the two apostolic prayers. Ephesians 1, 17 and 19. It's not the whole apostolic prayer. It's part of it. Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. There's two apostolic prayers in Ephesians. If you want to know what Paul's talking about, look at what he's praying for. If you can figure out what he's praying for, you're going to see what the whole book is talking about. Does that make sense? Okay, and his prayers are really clear that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. This is what the whole book is about. What are the riches of his glory? In the, the riches of the glory. You got to get the, the grammar right here or you'll miss it because you'll think this is about my inheritance, but it's not. It's about Jesus. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Paul's like, I'm praying that you would see when you're annoyed with the brother, you're annoyed with Jesus. When, you, when you're impatient with the brother, you're impatient with Jesus. And he's, he actually feels it. He sees it. He knows it. You might be like, I didn't say it. I just thought it. And he's like, Jesus heard it. He heard it. Can you see that's Jesus in front of you? Not fully formed Jesus, being born again Jesus. Can you see you are not fully formed Jesus? You are being born again Jesus, right? Can you have that kind of patience, okay? So he's saying you need vision for this. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? It's going to work is what he's saying. When you see the brother that's misbehaving, can you see his, Jesus' power is going to work? Can you have hope? It's not up to you to make it work. It's not up, it's not, you're not dumb if you believed it and it didn't work. Can you be conformed to the hope of Christ? Can you be conformed to the faith of Jesus? Can you just live in this tension of like, I know it's going to work. I think you're going to be, I think he's going to deal with you and because he's dealing with me and I'm going to pay attention to him dealing with me and I'm not going to focus on how you need to change. This is the way I interpret it, okay? What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Now, this is the second apostolic prayer. Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. Holy Spirit, would you come? Speak to our hearts. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Do you see everything Paul's talking about in Ephesians is about a family? It's about your personal relationships with him, with his body. It's about dwelling in heaven while you're hanging out with people on the earth. From the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints. You can't do this prayer by yourself. What he's praying for, he's not praying for you individually. He's saying that you would see this with all the rest of the saints, right? Right? That you would comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. You know, we misappropriate this passage all the time. I just got to know more about it. Width, height, depth of his love. And we're punching the people next to us. For real. 
He's like, no, you can't do this without everybody else. Can you learn to appreciate the great love he has for all the saints? That's how he's got love for you when you stumble, when you don't get it right, when you're flesh, when you're dust. If you can't see that, you can't see that. And the whole world is growing in an accusation right now against people that wait on him. The whole world is growing in an accusation right now, even if you didn't do anything wrong. Look at Hawaii. The whole world is growing in an accusation right now because it's afraid, because it doesn't know what's going to happen, because Jesus is literally returning, and the flesh is losing it. Can you go up? You've got one of the rare places on the planet to grow, go up and grow up, both. This is one of the, I've never seen another place like this where there's a mic like that ever, 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 ever. There's some places that have a mic, and those are glorious places. There's very few places where the mic is open all the time. That's hard, and it's beautiful. God's given you something he's going to hold you accountable for. Me too. Can we see an opportunity to plant something new? Now, the core central issue of Ephesians is a heavenly view of life called a good eye. You can't do any of the things we've talked about this morning if you're trying to have a life here and a life there. You can't be like, okay, I'm going to do the career, the family, and then I'm going to do the prayer room, I'm going to do the dividing in heaven, I'm going to do all that stuff, and I'm going to kind of make sure they don't collide with each other. This is the default mode of man. You have to say, I'm going to give everything to this heavenly reality, and I'm going to let my life chase me into heaven. There's no other gospel, there's no other salvation than what I just described to you. There's an American corruption of the gospel, but it's not real, and it will not work. You have to say, everything is his, my entire life. All the meaning, all the identity, all the, all the responsibility, all of it is his. And if you'll do that, he will make sure you're seen and understood as somebody who knew God in the age to come. Okay? In the age to come. This is important. Matthew 6, 19 to 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Stand with me, if you will. The lamp of the body is the eye. Steph, you and uh, Alia can come back up. If your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. He'll hate one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't save the way your kids see you. You can't save the way that your peers see you. You can't save the way the church sees you, the world sees you, your husband sees you, your wife sees you. And there's all these tethers that we have to the earth. They're really all about that. He says, you got to sever all those. you got to come up. If you do that, I care about the earth more than you. If you want that, I just want to pray for you. Holy Spirit in this room right now. Now, what I just said to you, it's not a do thing. You can't, you can't die to yourself. If you could, Jesus wouldn't have come and died on the cross. You can only recognize where you're not. But can you? Can you recognize where you haven't died yourself? It's where, it's where you feel pain. It's where you feel afraid. It's where your life looks uncertain. Your life is certain. It's predestined. It's predestined to be conformed to the body of Jesus. Predestined. You don't need to be afraid. I bind fear in the name of Jesus. You don't need to be uncertain about what eternity looks like for you. You don't need to be uncertain. you got a few years in front of you in the flesh. Don't let those steal everything you need for eternity. Don't let those cheap. This is what Isaiah said. He said, all flesh is grass. It's for burning. It's for burning. This, this life is a vapor. It's nothing. This is a momentary light affliction is what Paul said. It's a momentary light affliction. This is nothing. You are at the threshold of eternity. I want to tell you, all of creation declares it. You're at the threshold. You're at the door of eternity right now. 
You're seeing things. Thousands, millions, billions of people have longed to see faithful in the Lord their entire lives, living on the, in, the, in the, the places of heaven, looking at you. You're at the door right now. Don't trade it for a few years of grass burning. Holy Spirit in this room, pour it out. Pour out, pour out grace. Pour out grace just to tell you we need you. Pour out grace to tell you where we're anchored here on the earth and not in heaven. Pour out grace that we would come clean with you. You already see it. You already know it. God, let us face our fears right now. Let us face our worries about what our legacy means. God, pour it out in this place. Pour out freedom. I'm asking. I just see uh, people jumping up and down. I see worship, free worship, free worship, free worship, free worship. I see a house where people walk in and they don't care what they look like. They don't care what anybody thinks about them. We can plant those seeds. We're not living in that because we're not planting it. God, release freedom in this room. Release freedom. Holy Spirit, come. Fire. I just ask for fire. The light of your glory. God, that we'd feel the fear of the Lord that you're going to make something grow this fall. You're going to make something grow one way or the other. God, the light of your glory, the rain, the refreshing rain, the breeze. I've heard the, the wind prayed for a couple times in this room this week. Wind. Send wind right now, God. That's what the Holy Spirit's saying. Send wind right now. In the name of Yeshua. Yeshua.